Welcome to Fireside Giants. My name is Alex with my co-host here, Anthony Rivardo, and my friends. Take a nice, deep breath. I wanted to start off with some breathing exercises today after Shane Lemieux's report coming out that he had a knee injury and he was carted off the field. Just take a moment to breathe. Take a nice breath in, a nice breath out, and understand that all is good in the world because apparently it's not that serious. And in fact, he was walking around on the sidelines. He was training on the side with the trainers, and he seemed to be doing okay. He didn't. He wasn't walking with a limp. There was no torn ACL, none of that crazy bad stuff that would potentially ruin his entire season. In fact, Joe Judge went as far as to say um, that it, he's the kind of guy that would chew his own leg off to get back on the field if he was trapped in a bear trap. Um, very interesting an analogy he used, but I think that's kind of the main reason. They love Shane Lemieux as a player because he's tough. He's like Nick Gates. These guys, he's like Will Hernandez. These guys are tough. They just want to play. They want to be out on the field helping their team. And that stands out to me too, Anthony, you know? Um, so how are you feeling after that big injury scare? And, you know, is, are you kind of worried about this offensive line because of it? I'm feeling relieved. And I understand I've been a major critic of Shane Lemieux, but we can't afford to lose anybody on the offensive line, whether they're bad or not. Like, we just can't afford to lose anybody. We have no depth on the offensive line. So how am I feeling about the offensive line? I'm still petrified, as I have been all season long or all off season long. I'm petrified, terrified of this offensive line. I don't know how it's going to perform this year, but honestly, the way things are shaping out, I can't imagine it's going to perform all that well. Unless we see a major jump from Andrew Thomas, a major jump from Will Hernandez, major jump from Nick Gates. Like, we've got to see unprecedented level of improvement. So hopefully Rob Sale is the reason that that will happen. Hopefully Rob Sale is going to be, like, the best assistant coach hiring of the offseason for the Giants. I really, really hope so. I do have a lot of confidence in Rob Sale, that much I can say. I haven't heard too much about him during this training camp process. I really haven't seen any tweets from the beat writers about Rob Sale. But for my personal research that I did on Rob Sale this offseason— I'm very high on the guy. I think that he's awesome. He's only like 41 years old. Old. He's never coached in the NFL, and I actually think that's a major benefit for him. I really like that because if you look at the Giants' offensive line, Nick Gates is in his, what, third or fourth season. He's like the oldest guy on the offensive line, along with Will Hernandez, who's in his fourth season. Andrew Thomas is in his second year, Shane Lemieux in his second year, and Matt Pear in his second year. They're all young guys. who have, None of them have reached their second contracts yet. Like None of them have gone through a full rookie deal they're all young players basically college level players and all rob sale knows how to do is coach college level players he's never coached an old season veteran like a nate solder but he's coached plenty of andrew thomas's who are 21 year old offensive tackles so I'm really confident in Rob Sale. I think that he's going to have a major impact on the development of the offensive line. And for anybody who's worried about the fact that he has no coaching experience in the NFL, that's why the Giants went and got Pat Flaherty as an offensive consultant. He was the offensive line coach for the Giants when they won the Super Bowl in, I believe, 2012. And even in 2008, I know he has like 40 years of NFL coaching experience. So all of that combined with Freddie Kitchens also taking a more expanded role on the offensive line as well. I'm not as worried, you know, as I once was after reading about Rob Sale and the changes that we made to this coaching staff. But still, if Rob Sale doesn't have the impact that we're hoping for, this offensive line, we got a major wake-up call yesterday when we got that injury scare from Shane Lemieux. It could be a pretty scary season on the offensive line this year, but thankfully, Shane Lemieux seems like he's going to be okay. I doubt he misses any regular season playing time for this, um, and hopefully he bounces back with a much better year because he's been working his ass off to improve the season. Yeah, I mean, as far as, as I'm concerned, um, I'm not sure the extent of the injury, but he didn't look like he was hampering him that much. He looked like he wasn't walking gingerly at all, um, which is a big positive sign. And like you mentioned, the thing about having Rob Sale coming out of college is that, you know, a lot of these established coaches in the NFL suck. They just suck. Like, Mark Colombo absolutely sucked. Um, the guy before him, the Giants had, I forget, what was his name? Um, uh, what was it? Do you remember his name? Hal Hunter. Oh, yeah, Hal Hunter, the he guy sucked that even worse. fired, you know what I mean? not <laughs> even in the league, and the pet trimmer's like, hey, come coach us. That's what I'm Horrible. saying. These A lot of these NFL-level coaches are not good coaches. Like, they just they just aren't. And, you know, at least you were getting some fresh blood, a guy that um, did really good things with the Louisiana football program, um, and he's a hand-picked coach from Joe Judge, and that's always optimistic for me because a lot of the coaches that Joe Judge brought in here – turned out to be great, and I think that's a, a sign. You know, that's a positive sign. I think that he trusts him, and, and Rob Sale apparently has a very different uh, mentality, and I, th I think it was Shane Lemieux. It might have been Nick Gates um, who said this, and this was really stood out to me, really interesting. 
He said that Mark Colombo's pass protection snaps, the way the the fundamentals he was teaching were more vertical based, right? So you were standing straight up and it was really putting you on an island. You know, it was really it was really allowing guys to take you on 1v1. Um, but Rob Sales fundamentals, his strategy is more of a slide protection scheme. And the slide protection scheme allows you know, guys to help each other. It's not an island uh, situation. So those guys can slide over. They can help out, um, you know, in that in that sort of protection. Um, and it really will benefit each other instead of, you know, forcing guys like Shalem you to stand up on their own and try to take on guys like Danny Shelton or Dexter Lawrence. And he doesn't have the size, just doesn't have the frame to stand up on an island and do that in vertical pass rush snaps or pass um, blocking snaps. So I think that's a really positive sign in that slide technique that they're using now to help one another and really push guys away from Daniel Jones and push guys away uh, from the middle so that, that you know, you're collapsing on the guards here. I think that will really cover up a lot of issues that were presented last season for the Giants um, in that interior penetration. So I, I'm really hoping that this is a big step forward, that, you know, Rob Sale does take this, this offensive line to the next level. And obviously health is a big part here because without Shane Lemieux, you're taking a potential starter right out of the lineup like on a second day of practice. This is really good news. I breathed a lot easier this morning when I saw it. Um, you know, they have Kenny Wiggins, who's a former Detroit Lions um, offensive lineman, uh, getting first team snaps today. Zach Fulton doesn't seem to be, but maybe he's just working his way in. Um, so we'll see. We'll, we'll watch this as, as it progresses, but it's a really good sign that Shane Lemieux is not going to be out. And Joe Judge said this specifically, worst case scenario looks to have been avoided, which is a great sign. Um, I think that's a tremendous thing. He also said, one thing I'll tell you about Shane, he's kind of like a wild animal. He'll shoot his leg off through a bear trap if he had to, so him not being out there kind of drives him nuts. And I think that's a really good sign, because Anthony said it before, right? Um, essentially, Lemieux's been working all offseason trying to improve his game, you know, refine his, his technique, adapt to this new strategy and scheme that they're ready to implement. Um, and him being out there is, is another step forward to him being a starter, and him not being on the field really, really hurts. Every minute he's not on the field, it really, really hurts. Um, so, you know, moving over to a couple of other, you know, players that I did see on the injury report, um, Kadarius Tony, obviously COVID, he's working his way back, Shane Lemieux, Lorenzo Carter, not sure exactly what's going on there, might just be um, small, slight inflammation of his uh, Achilles, you know, just easing him in, it's hot out there uh, with all the pads on, there in shells today and Saturday, Derek Dillon, another guy who was on the side, Allison Smith was on the side, Chad Slade was, um, he did not practice due to a personal reason. Matt Pert still on the pup list. Saquon Barkley's been out there just, you know, running around a little bit. Austin Mack is a guy who went down, apparently has a hamstring injury. He's fighting for a roster spot, so that's really unfortunate uh, for Austin Mack. But I'm, I'm curious, like, Anthony, do you think Lorenzo Carter just kind of working through, you know, you know, rehabilitation from Achilles injury? I know he wasn't on the pup list, which is a really good sign, but maybe they're just easing him along. Yeah, here's a tweet from Pat Leonard. He said Lorenzo Carter was on the bike today after seemingly tweaking something lower body yesterday. So I guess it might not just be that he's recovering. It sounds like he actually pulled something or had some sort of cramp, some lingering, you know, tweak in his lower body. Um, maybe he had a calf cramp yesterday and it's still sore, you know, something like that. That's what it sounds like to me. Um, it could be related to his Achilles. I really hope not because I'm hoping that he truly is fully healthy and recovered from that. But it does sound like he has something lower body that's bothering him, so he's got to stretch it out on the bike, and he's just going to take it easy for the next couple of days, which I think is the proper thing to do. Let's take it easy with Lorenzo Carter. Let's not rush him back. Let's make sure that he's a 1,000% healthy because we really need him this season, especially if you take a look at Patrick Graham's defensive scheme, that 3-3-5 odd. We talked with TFG, that franchise guy, on our live stream about that, and one thing that if you do enough research on the 3-3-5 odd defense, you'll notice that the middle linebacker is going to be Blake Martinez. Next to him on the weak side is going to be Jabril Peppers most likely. But on the strong side, it's likely a guy like Lorenzo Carter, who's a pass rusher primarily, but has some instincts in coverage. Like, we need some drop back in coverage mentality from that spot. And Lorenzo Carter fits that role really, really nicely. And if the Giants do plan on making that their base defense this year, that nickel 335, Lorenzo Carter is going to play a huge role in that defense, and he's going to be a major X factor for the team's defensive stability. I mean, there's not many guys that can actually fill that role like Lorenzo Carter. We hope that Aziz Ojalari can develop into that role, but right now, Lorenzo Carter seems like an essential piece of the defense that the Giants are trying to build, so I'm really hoping that he's healthy or at least gets healthy by the start of the season. 
Yeah, and you know, I do want to shift over to the offense for a second because a lot of reporters are saying that the Giants' offense is struggling mightily to start camp. And, you know, it's to be expected. I, I would be very happy if they were in midseason form right now, but at the end of the day, he, you know, Daniel Jones has tons of new weapons to work with. Kenny Galladay, Kadarius Tony still working his way back. Um, Kyle Rudolph, offensive line, still not established, but Daniel Jones is missing a lot of throws. Um, is it reason for concern? I don't think so. It's only the third day of camp. Tons of time to ramp up. How many times have we seen uh, reports of players missing this, missing that, had a really bad day, and then the regular season comes around, they're just fine. You know, this this is camp for a reason. They're supposed to be ironing out the kinks. Um, but he does look a lot quicker in the backfield. I did I did uh, hear that, that his, he's looking quicker um, in his drop back in the pocket. It looks a lot more smooth, looks a lot more comfortable. And I think that's really the main thing. We know he has the arm talent. It's just a matter of the awareness and the quickness and the processing ability that he really needs to improve upon. Um, and I think that's one thing. And, you know, his top targets, I love the matchup between Kenny Galladay and James Bradbury. That's one position, um, like battle, not battle, but really just uh, kind of competition there that's going to iron each other out really well. I think, you know, that iron sharpens iron mentality is definitely an, an application here because Kenny Galladay has been locked down by James Bradbury, apparently, like barely any separation. And I think that's a good thing, you know. When you throw the ball to Kenny Galladay, he has the wingspan, he has the reach to be able to catch any pass. But going up against James Bradbury, who's one of the top quarterbacks in the NFL right now, is going to make him better. It's, that's what you want. Last year, James Bradbury is facing off against guys like you know Shepard, who's good, um, and that was really it. Darius Slayton, who's also you know good but not great. Kenny Galladay is a true wide receiver one, and the, those two guys going at it is going to be fantastic. Another two players that have stood out, Adore Jackson and Julian Love. Adore Jackson's looked really good, really athletic, really fast, um, agile. Julian Love, who you know we absolutely love, pun intended, on this team, um, is, is really the ideal utility player. And I think he is a perfect reserve guy in case of injury, in case of whatever, COVID, who knows. He is able to fill so many roles on cornerback, slot, safe, strong safety, free safety, um, he's he's kind of a jack of all trades in the in the secondary, and that's such a great thing to have back there. Um, and I'm really excited to see what he can accomplish. But you know, Anthony, when you're looking at this offense and you're seeing the kinks, you're seeing the hiccups. You're looking at Daniel Jones saying he missed a couple of passes. He missed some short ones to Devonte Booker. He missed one to Evan Ingram that Logan Ryan picked off. Are you getting concerned? Are you like, okay, this is maybe not the best you know show of uh, of hand right now for DJ? But is it too early to even make an assumption? I think it's too early to make an analysis. It's training camp. They're playing in shorts and t-shirts. There's nothing that you can really take away from quarterback play in that situation, in my opinion. I mean, sure, you can take a look at his mental processing, his ability to read coverages, but this is all base, easy stuff. They're taking it light. They're just getting back into football speed. I'm not all that concerned. If this is still going on two weeks from now, if they don't break out of the slump at all, if there's not one day that the Giants offense wins a practice... One, it could be, you know, positive. Maybe the Giants' defense is just that damn good, and we're looking at a historic season by this defense. But on the other hand, yeah, if within the next two weeks the Giants' offense doesn't show any signs of improvement, then there's reason to be concerned. But three practices in, no, I'm not concerned just yet. I mean, it's only July 30th. Football season doesn't really even start until September, right? I mean, you get preseason in August, but we've got like two weeks until the first preseason game. So I think it's time we just relax a little bit, you know, take it easy here with the offense. Let's not go into a panic mode. Okay, I think everything's going to be okay. Um, but I do want to say another thing is Kadarius Tony's not even on the field. We're thinking that he's going to be this major factor that opens up the offense, Saquon Barkley as well. Neither of those, those guys are on the field. So we're talking about Daniel Jones having all these weapons and getting all these weapons back. Two of his main weapons aren't even on the field. So it's just Kenny Galladay, it's Sterling Shepard, Darius Slayton, and Devontae Booker, which is still a pretty solid group. But, yeah, man, I'm not too worried about the offense right now. I just think it's too early. It's too soon to tell with them. I think, you know, give it a couple more practices, and I think they're going to start to ramp up and start to play a little bit better. Usually, I feel like every year the defense starts out better than the offense for every team in training camp. The offense just kind of has to settle in, install those base concepts, and get back up to speed. But the defense is just building on what they did last year. You know, there wasn't a lot of overturn on the de defensive roster like there was on the offensive roster. 
on the defensive side of the ball, it's basically just what we did the last six weeks. Now let's expand on that because the last six weeks are when they jumped into that 3-3-5 base and they really started to get Xavier McKinney back. They started to use Julian Love in a lot more creative ways. And that's when the defense really started to gel. So now they're trying to take what they did in those final six weeks and then apply that to all of the rookies coming back from injuries, the rookies who are coming in, and the newly signed players and just kind of mesh that together. But offensively, we're like, okay, we need a brand new identity on offense. Everything we did for all 17 weeks of the season last year, 16 weeks, was terrible. We have to change that, and we have to bring in all these new players to install basically a brand new offense. So, of course, the defense is building upon what they did last year. So they're already having a step ahead of the offense, which is basically scratching everything they did last year and rebuilding that offense's upcoming season. So I think it makes sense that the offense is struggling for these first few practices, but I think give it a week. Two at the top, if they're not, by the end of like August 7th, if the offense hasn't shown any signs of improvement, then I'm worried. But for now, let's take it easy, let's relax, and let's just hope that they start to pick it up real soon here. Yeah, I agree. I think it's way too early. Day three of camp is not a good justification for any sort of assumption or negative uh, narrative going on. But a couple other uh, headlines and top takeaways include a nice little dust-up between Nick Gates and TJ Brunson, who destroyed Kenny Galladay coming across the middle. Um, He made a nice catch, and TJ Brunson popped him for it, you know, right across the middle. Definitely don't want to do that to your wide receiver one, but it's football. You know, Kenny Galladay was asked about it, and he was like, he shrugged it off and was like, it's football. This is what happens. You know, you're trying to, you want to take these hits because you're going to take them in the regular season. You got to be ready. You got to be able to hang on to that football. You know, this is how it is. TJ Brunson, linebacker, trying to make the team. Um, he's trying to show out and, you know, made a nice play. I, I'm, what am I going to say? You know, he made a football play. Don't hit our wide receiver one. Of course, I'd prefer if he didn't. But at the end of the day, you know, this is the way it is. And when when full pads come on, it's going to be just like that. So um, Nick Gates, though, came running up, got in TJ Brunson's face. Logan Ryan kind of uh, de-escalated the situation as he usually does. But Nick Gates, man, he's the one guy I would love to have in battle. If, I, if it was like the Stone Age and we all were running around with swords and stuff trying to take each other's land— I'd want Nick Gates as my top as my top weapon. I'd want him as my best uh, fighter because that guy, if you're if you're if you have the balls to throw hands with Aaron Donald, I want you on my team. You know what I mean? He he went face to face with Aaron Donald. I want you on my team. And Nick Gates is the same as Shane Lemieux. Those guys are dogs. You know they're they're out there to play hard and they come to the defense of their players. Um, and I'd love to see it. You know he's always the first guy up trying to trying to. Um, you know, protect his guys. And I think that's a really strong sign that this team cares for each other. They have good uh, mentality. They have a good locker room. So that really stood out to me. Um, but nothing nothing crazy there. Just a little, a little mix-up during training camp happens all the time. A couple more things. CJ Board, he is competing for that fifth or sixth wide receiver spot, looking really good apparently. Also has a utility on special teams, which is really important. You know, those back-end wide receivers need to have an application on special teams. Austin Mack, you know, of course, the hamstring injury was looking good, but the injury could really hurt him. John Ross made a couple of nice catches against the back with, with the backup quarterbacks. Um, you know, he signed, a, I think, a one-year 2.25 or $2.5 million deal. So he has $1 million guaranteed, I believe. So, of course, they would prefer, prefer for him to make the team, maybe serve as a punt returner. Jabril Peppers also in the mix there. Kadarius Tony in the mix there. Um, you know, Sterling Shepard, Darius Slayton, a lot of guys who could be that punt returner for them. Um, but John Ross has that breakaway speed and the ability to change the course of a game at any given moment, which is what's so exciting about him. So we'll see how he kind of develops over the next couple of weeks if he can make this roster. Rookie Rodarius Williams, who we interviewed after he was drafted, picked off quarterback Clayton Thorson in the end zone. He was celebrating, getting really hyped. Um, love to see it. You know, we were rooting for Rodarius. He's a guy that probably is a fringe roster player, could land on the practice squad. If he keeps making plays like this, though, he's a little bit older. I think he's 24 years old. Um, so he has a little bit more experience. He's Greedy Williams' brother. So he has, you know, football runs in his genes, runs in his blood. Um, and I'm really hoping that, you know, he pans out and he can really uh, make this team maybe as a punt gunner, which would be really good for him. I'm excited to see how he can develop. Um, let's see what else is going on here. So the, the opposite linebacker spot from Blake Martinez has been kind of a rotating situation. Tay Crowder, uh, Carter Coughlin is, is kind of filling that role. Carter Coughlin has a really eerily similar frame to Fred Warner. Not the same player at all, not even comparing those two, but their physical traits are very similar. If Carter Coughlin can really kind of develop into a decent, just at least a, a close to average pass coverage linebacker, he could be a pretty solid guy next to Blake Martinez because you know he's a good run stopper. He already has pass rush moves. 
Um, I would I would really love to see what Patrick Graham can do with a guy like Carter Coughlin as a middle linebacker next to Blake Anthony. You know, when you're looking at Carter, do you think that's a role that he can fit? Do you think that maybe they could do some unique things with him in the future if he can, you know, kind of solve that position right there? Yeah, Lorenzo Carter is really exciting because I do know that in the past we've had discussions on this podcast and we've said Carter maybe – Oh, Carter Coughlin. Yeah, Carter Coughlin as well. He's also exciting because he's making the transition to inside linebacker. He was playing edge rusher last year, and I think that he showed a lot of great things as an edge rusher. You know, he was a really good pass rusher at Minnesota. I remember watching his film and seeing his stats. I think he led the um, Big 12 or something in pressures in 2018. Whatever year he was competing with Chase Young, he was like second in PFF pass rushing grade to only Chase Young. He was phenomenal that season, and he did a really, really good job um, this in his rookie season kind of transitioning to this hybrid role he wasn't really just playing edge rusher because they were moving him around and he wasn't really just pass rushing every down he was doing a lot of things like QB spies QB contains and I think that's really important for Carter Coughlin now transitioning to inside linebacker because those QB spies are really valuable from the inside linebacker position if he has the range to go sideline to sideline from the inside linebacker spot you know put him in the dime defense have him just stand there and just man mark the quarterback That'll be really key, especially as the Giants, you know, we face teams like even Dallas, for example, with um, Dak Prescott. He's a quarterback that likes to get out of the pocket, make some plays with his legs, scramble by time. Now we have Carter Coughlin, who's kind of just going to, his whole job is going to be prevent Dak Prescott from doing that. Even Jalen Hurts likes to do that. I know we all think Jalen Hurts is trash, because he is, but he still likes to get out of the pocket and he likes to move around. And now again, Carter Coughlin can fill that role playing that QB spy and also those QB contains on those um, stunts and those twists around. And of course, he can also pass rush off the edge since that's where his career began. So you can have him twist around to the edge from the inside linebacker spot and then get one on one with an offensive tackle and hopefully get some wins there and create some pressure. So I like Carter Coughlin a lot. I think he showed a lot of promise, especially in those final six weeks that I keep mentioning for this defense. You know, you think back to the Seattle game, he was playing a lot of that versatile role, playing a lot of that QB spy and QB contain. Those final six weeks are what I'm really looking at for this defense. And Carter Coughlin had a pretty big role to play in those final six weeks. So assuming that they're going to continue to build on those final weeks, I do think that Carter Coughlin's role will expand a little bit, and I do think that he can play a really solid, you know, role next to Blake Martinez as an inside linebacker. Well, that would be ideal, you know, because we do have a little bit of a hole there um, next to Blake, you know, Devontae Downs, Tay Crowder, uh, TJ Brunson, a couple of guys, Reggie Ragland, that will all be competing for starting reps. Carter Coughlin is a little bit intriguing, though, because of his pass rush abilities, you know, being able to use him in that way, um, and especially against the run, if he can if he can break through those gaps uh, quickly and really use those pass rush moves at the second level, it could be a pretty good thing for him to make that transition. So I'm excited to see how this team continues to progress, guys. Uh, you know, padded practices will be next week, I believe. They'll be starting at some point. Um, for now, they're just in shells. Um, you know, that's why the hit against Kenny Galladay was a little bit crazy. But at the end of the day, it is football, and you have to expect those things. Um, you know, one of the things that really stood out to me that this secondary, they've already looked so good during camp, is the fact that they've been working all offseason together down in Tampa with, you know, Logan Ryan and his personal trainer. They've been gaining chemistry, like Dory Jackson, uh, Julian Love, Logan. Uh, I know Jabril Peppers was there. Darnay Holmes was there. A lot of these guys, uh, Maje Harper, a lot of these guys were down in Tampa working together already, just transitioning over to training camp. That's probably why they look so good right now, by the way. The offense, yes, they had a couple of, of practices with each other, you know, getting some stuff in. But those secondary guys, man, I really do think the Giants have a top five secondary in the NFL, if not one of the best, if not the best. Like, they, they are so good. Their chemistry is locked down. Their talent is that good. They can really have a special team this year. Darnay Holmes has really been standing out during camp. He's looked really good. Um, I've, I've seen uh, Xavier McKinney's also been looking fantastic. He even said it was nice to get the experience last year, but he's getting ready. He's ramping up, and like things are li- looking positive for him. Um, we're talking about a defense here that if the pass rush comes together strongly, the interior defense stays strong, those linebackers stay consistent, and that secondary is as good as we think they are, this could be one. This could be the best defense in football. You know, I truly believe that. I think that's what how, why kind of the offense is struggling. We're talking about a bottom of the barrel offense last year that just got a ton of new weapons. They're trying to get the scheme down. They're trying to apply it to the field. 
um, and they're facing off against one of the best defenses in football. You know, of course they're going to look bad. Of course they're going to have trouble. But if they can beat that defense in practice and they start stringing together a couple of good practices, that's when we should be getting excited. That's going to tell us all we need to know because if, if they can beat that defense in practice, those average defenses that we play in the coming weeks in the regular season, we're going to crush those teams. You know, we're going to kill them. So that's what we want to see. We want to see progress over the next couple of weeks. Uh, first preseason game coming up in about two weeks. Um, and I'm really excited to see what the Giants can really put on the field and um, how exciting uh, that's all going to unfold before our eyes. And Julian Love, just to give you a parting quote from Joe Judge, he says, Joe Judge always says, in the Mississippi heat, it takes more than one hand to grease a pig. No idea what that means. If anyone wants to take a guess at that, please leave that in the comment section in YouTube. Anthony, if you have any idea what that means, please, you know, let me know. I really don't, but I just know I think it's an awesome quote. Joe Judge is an awesome person. He's always got the colorful language, as he mentioned yesterday, and I love that. I think that he's such a character, and he's just so fun to cover as, you know, guys who make content about the Giants. He's so fun to cover, and he really makes um, covering the Giants just a much more enjoyable experience. I love what Joe Judge is doing, and I love that, you know, players are quoting Joe Judge and talking about how much they love Joe Judge. You can just see the culture here is different than it was a year or two ago, and Joe Judge plays a major part in changing that culture, and he's done a phenomenal job with the Giants, so I'm excited. I do think that big things are ahead for him, and I think that Calvin Benjamin will ultimately be proven completely wrong about him not being able to win a Super Bowl, because to me, Joe Judge is showing all of the signs of a winner, and I can't wait to see him finally win a good amount of games with the Giants, hopefully this upcoming season. Yeah, absolutely. And, and one thing that I saw today on social media, just before we uh, sign off here, it was pretty funny, actually. I saw Miles Sanders catching footballs over a garbage can, and I just thought of so many jokes to go with that. Just like Miles Sanders catching footballs right over a garbage bin. Like, how, how else can you describe the Philadelphia fan base um, was he, and that team? Was he doing one-on-ones with Darius Slay? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Or Avanta Maddox, better, better off for him. <laughs> Literally a garbage pail. Like, just piece of poop. Um, <laughs> and I have to say though, it was, it was hilarious though. Cause I'm like, he was throwing the balls into the garbage can. And I was just sitting there like, Oh my God, how many jokes could I possibly make about this right now? Um, but I'm going to spare myself cause those Eagles fans absolutely despise me. So in the, any chance, any chance they get to come after my soul and my family, they will, they savages, those people, absolute savages from the barbaric times of Genghis Khan off, off just ridiculous people. So anyway, uh, <laughs> hope you guys enjoyed this episode of Fireside Giants. We'll be with you guys over the weekend, of course. Let so, you know any big news that unfolds, Shane Lemieux injury updates, anything that um, you know happens. Really, we got you guys covered as always, my friends. Make sure to subscribe below on YouTube, Apple, and Spotify. We'll do some live streams next week, possibly you know discussing some training camp instead of some uh, just regular breakdown episodes. We'll do some live streams and talk to you guys about what you're thinking, any questions and opinions you want us to, to you know to detail and really give our opinion on. So I'm excited to talk with you guys as well in the future. Make sure to hit that subscribe button and we'll catch you guys on the next episode.